A checklist. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, all right. So we begin. <clears throat> A little bit daunting, you know, to enter into this book. I, I remember the first time I began reading this book, I went to the, uh, <clears throat> to the Arcane School celebration <clears throat> of the Shambhala Impact in 1975, 37 years ago was it? And uh, I had a little spare time and I was a relatively new member of the Arcane School. I had joined in 1972 and I said, well, why don't I read just a little bit in the Rays and the Initiation? So I was very excited because, you know, we were, you know, the Shambhala Impact, the Taurus Full Moon at that time was going to be very, uh, and, and, and little did I know that 25 years later I would be celebrating the next Shambhala impact in the Waysack Valley. That was a certain elevation in the game, you know. We climbed to 15,000 something feet, <clears throat> a bit more actually, almost 16,000. And there in fact was that flat rock that DK describes in the Waysack Valley. It was there and we were all up there, eight of us, <clears throat> significant number I think, for a um, a two-hour meditation at the exact time of the full moon, you know. Of course, I think we confirmed that the Buddha's appearance is etheric. <laughs> he didn't have tea with us on the rock, but uh, we, we felt that there was, you know, it was a very strong presence. So I began to read uh, more earnestly, more seriously, the rays and the initiations back 35 years ago. And then, you know, continued and starting and restarting it and trying to go deeper and deeper into it. Something has to happen in the group process uh, with people, which will uh, somehow allow these words uh, to make a deeper impact. Um, you know, frankly, we are uh, just beginning, really, aren't we? When you think about you see, some people, you know, seeking novelty, they say, well, heavens, Alice Bailey was written back in the 1950s, so why are you, you know, not even 1950s earlier, why are you setting it now? Well, it just so happens that the Tibetan gave us material from the archives of Shambhala. That's why we're studying it now. I mean, the great libraries and the great repositories where the timeless texts are kept. That's what he's sharing with us. So in this search for novelty, uh, people who have not even scratched the surface of these uh, old commentaries are already moving on to the next distortion or the next watering down, uh, which seems to me very unwise. I think things will be put in their proper place when following 2025 in that year and following the third installment of the teaching begins. He promises us that, and he talks especially about esoteric astrology, how there will be more done along that line. We haven't any idea, really. But you know, there has to be a clearing. Uh, it was anticipated that World War I would be such a clearing. And it was called the Great War. And uh, he said, basically, none of this would have been possible if conditions remained as they were before World War I. So following World War I, here came the armistice in uh, 1918. And in 1919, the Tibetan contacts Alice Bailey and begins this 30 years of work. I have a feeling that, you know, there will be, again, a kind of a clearing. Um, in which Pluto does its work during the next um, 13 years before 2025. And then again, he'll be able to do his work. Whether it will be done with Alice Bailey, we cannot say. You know, some people who are, are a bit in the know have said, well, okay, she's already taken uh, incarnation um, and is ready to work again. But, you know, we don't know that uh, for sure. We just know that whatever emerges will be under... Um, the same impression, he says, and it will carry the teaching further. And then all the nonsense that's been written in the last 30 or 40 years, you know, all the stuff that's very heavily tainted by astralism will be revealed for what it is, the great distortion that it is. 
and then we'll, you know, get more of the real teaching. If I'm sounding a bit like a purist, I guess I am when it comes, uh, you know, look, it, whatever helps people is of value. Uh, we're all in a state of illusion. All is illusion, O dweller in the shadows. We're all in illusion. But we can ascend by lessening degrees of illusion. So there are illusions which only the highest human thinkers are capable of conceiving. They're still an illusion. And then there are illusions which we should have outlived long ago. And I don't think we should waste our time with those. And yet they litter the bookstores in such a way that now, you know, you either have to look for heaven or on the floor to find the Alice Bailey books anymore. They used to be right there in the center, right there in front of you. But, you know, people have gotten, in a way, I think, a little bit lazy. They don't want to read. They don't want to ponder. They want instant, you know, the MTV consciousness. What's the next astral image in front of your eye, you know? So, I mean, you know, talk about solar plexus and personalism and astralism. Most of what MTV is that. And, you know, to ponder in this archaic English, these recondite words, you know, who wants to do that? And yet, that is the way to the opening door of deeper understanding. Okay, so we'll begin. <clears throat> and uh, we actually have quite an interesting horoscope, you know, uh, for when we started uh, today. Like I say, Sirius is on the ascendant exactly, to the minute of arc. 1415, 1415, to the minute of arc. But Sirius is no easy ride, is it? You know, it's, call, it's called the scorcher, and it does burn away all kinds of things in our nature. So Sirius is not an easy star by any means. It's the whole system of initiation we're given <laughs> under Sirius. So if we're going to be studying the rays and the initiation, somehow it's very propitious that Sirius would be rising just two minutes away from the time that we decided we would meet, at uh, 7.45 to start meditation. Instead, we started at 7.43, which, uh, you know, is, is just fine. Well, look, um, I hope you can more or less see this, but I suppose you can see it well enough, you know. Uh, we now begin our study of the 14 rules for those who are seeking initiation in one or other of its degrees. So he lays it right out, doesn't he? This is a book about seeking initiation and especially uh, group initiation, which he was not able to accomplish with his specially selected group. The requirements were very high. One of the group members had not yet taken the first initiation, and this held back all the others in a way. He says, because your brother here has not taken the first initiation, the rest of the group cannot take it. So that's a very strong learning, isn't it, about the group process. And he said, added to it, and besides, you're not ready anyway. So <laughs> he just tried to put things in proportion. Um, in Initiation Human and Solar, I gave the rules for those proposing to enter the grades of discipleship. There's a big hint here. When does real discipleship begin? Real discipleship. Second person. See, technically... Second initiation. Well, okay. Okay, there's some theosophical ideas that say that. Um, <coughs> the path of probationary discipleship begins before the first initiation. But the real disciple the initiate of the first degree, and the one who enters the Hall of Wisdom, and the one who is opening the sacrifice petals of the egoic lotus, those things go together. So I would say that in a way you're a probationary disciple until you're an accepted disciple. As an accepted disciple, somewhere between the first and second initiation, but more towards the second, you can be recognized uh, as such. So discipleship, as I understand it, really begins at the time of the first initiation. Although there's, you know, it's not an exact term, and even the Christ is a disciple. So we have to be careful how we 
use the term. But initiation human and solar is all about the first three initiations for the individual. Whereas the rays and initiations is about the initiations for the group. And really, you know, I, I think you'll agree with me, this whole book begins at the third initiation. Basically, the door is left behind. That is a happening of the past. So, you know, we are in a way uh, aspirants to the state of understanding which is given in this book. So human and solar can take you all the way through the third initiation. You know, you sometimes just say, well, it's just discipleship. Well, that's where discipleship ends. He said at the third initiation, technically speaking, in human terms, you are no longer called a disciple. You are called an initiate at that time. And when he had some people in his group who were both uh, like, you know, the, the psychologist Roberto Asagioli, you know maybe of his work, Psychosynthesis and the Act of Will and so forth, he, he called him an, an initiate disciple. That's how he put his particular category. He was of the third degree at a certain point in his life, and I suppose he would have called Alice Bailey an initiate disciple, something of that nature. He calls himself a disciple. We begin to realize that the word disciple is a term that um, is a rather high term. A lot of people are put off by that term because it sounds like you're giving up your will to be a disciple. And, you know, in these very individualistic days, we all want to do what we want to do. So we don't necessarily want to acquiesce to a higher form of training. But the only way we're really going to be free is by disciplining ourselves. And, of course, it's always the thing that we don't recognize about ourselves that needs the most discipline. You know, we all have certain uh, faults, and we, you know, we're aware of those faults. But then there are these things called blind spots. Mary Bailey used to joke. Uh, I didn't realize it was a joke, but then I realized later it was a joke. She said, well, I have several blind spots, and I'm aware of every one of them. So I thought, <laughs> I, oh, that's good. She's aware of them then. You know, then later... I began to realize that she was uh, having a joke at my expense. Um, yeah. She also told me, I remember when I reached the age of 40, you know, I had my sort of birthday I, I, in, in the office. And um, I said somewhat facetiously, I said, uh, oh, I'm 40 now. I guess I'm reaching the age of maturity. She says, well, I don't see any sign of it. <laughs> she had a certain first first-rate quality, you know. Anyway, um, gay <laughs> okay, so I would like, uh, he says, for a minute to deal with the significance of the word rule and to give you some idea of its cold meaning. There is much difference between a law, an order, or command, and a rule, and these distinctions should be pondered with care. Uh, law, order, or command, or rule. So the laws of the universe are simply the modes of expression, uh, the life impulses, and the way of existence or activity of the one in whom we live and move and have our being. And, you know, who or what is that? The one in whom we live and move and have our being. What really is that? What shall we say it is? He usually has a certain level that he means by that. Any ideas? To, you know, because sometimes you say, well, it might be the planetary logos, because we're just, as monads, we are cells in the planetary logos, so we live and move and have our being in the planetary logos, and this is, of course, uh, true. This is uh, true to a degree. But it's almost always, when you really analyze what he's talking about, it's almost always the solar logos that he means, by the one in whom we live and move and have our being. He almost always means that. Of course, obviously, you could extend the idea, couldn't you? Because there are greater and greater beings, and in a sense, we live and move and have our being uh, in them. So these laws, this great being, the solar logos, let us say, uh, has certain ways of expressing certain life directions, a way of being, and those things we cannot change. Uh, my old teacher used to say, you know, he was very first ray, he had, I think, a second-rate soul and a first-rate personality. Um, and he said, nobody, no one breaks the law. 
the law breaks them. That's a kind of a first-rate statement, isn't it? I said, oh, all right. <laughs> Began to realize what I was dealing with here. Okay, there is no avoiding these laws in the last analysis. And there is no denying them, for we are eternally swept into activity by them. When a great force comes along and moves you, it's called a sweep. <clears throat> swept am I by the universal life, and as I sweep upon my onward way, the way of God, you know, it's great force. Either swept away or swept in the right direction. We are eternally swept into activity by them, and they govern and control from the angle of the eternal now. It always is so. It always persists. It always is. It always will be. No evasion within our system at all. So it, it governs and controls all that happens in time and space. Um, time and space. Well, we don't need to get into that. You know, some people say, oh, well, I'm now in the soul and time is over. And space doesn't exist. But, you know, uh, I don't, I think if you really think deeply, the whole universe is time and space. Uh, he, there's, it, that's why he usually says time and space as we understand. That, you know, that's what he, he doesn't say that it's all completely abrogated, gone, it doesn't exist. It's how the human being understands time and space, and then how the master understands time and space. It's very different. Now, orders and commands are the feeble interpretations which men give to what they understand by law. So it doesn't have the same authority, is it? And it's been put through the human mind. And the law says this, so I order you and command you to do that. That's what, uh, and, and you know, we have a, re we can rebel against orders and commands because usually they don't represent the higher law. Sometimes with, with very wise people they do. But we can't rebel against the law, can we? An order or command, well, you said it. Why do I have to listen to you? But a law is so fundamental, there's just no use to rebel against it. In time and space and at any given moment and in any location, these commands are issued by those who are in a position of authority or who seem to dominate or are in a position to enforce their wishes. Have you in your life been subject to the commands of others ever? <laughs> I guess so. Huh? I guess so. You could even say that, you know, the parents... Uh, give the order, give the command, especially if they are uh, first-ray parents. Uh, so orders, it says, are indicative of human frailty and limitation. Okay, he doesn't seem to think very much of orders and commands. Although, you know, he says no master will ever order you to do something, ever command you to do something. But I'm remembering something in one of the Agni Yoga books. Maybe it was written by... Uh, Nicholas Rorick, in fact, but it was basically Moria saying, when I say run, run, when I say jump, jump, when I say get out of the way, get out of the way, you know, it like that. Whether this was Nicholas Rorick's interpretation or whether it was actually Moria speaking, I don't know, but it's a very different first-ray approach. DK being a second-ray master, he basically says, okay, we don't order you to do anything. We make suggestions. Do you have the eyes to see and understand and follow the suggestions? See, there were a lot of people in his group that were not doing what he asked. He said, do these meditations, write these meditation reports, do this in a rhythmic manner, and they didn't. So he never once ordered them to do that. He tried to persuade them that the approach they were having was not useful to them. It's a second-rate method, more so. Now, rules, however, are different. They are the result of tried experience and of age-long undertaking and assuming neither the form of laws nor the limitations of a command, they are recognized by those for whom they exist and hence evoke from them a prompt intuitive response. What does that mean? They are recognized by those for whom they exist and so evoke from them a prompt and intuitive response. Rules do this. See, we're about to study 14 rules, aren't we? And here's the question. Are they rules for you? Are they rules for me? Are they? Or are they just some writing 
that we don't really recognize as rules because we have not responded intuitively to them. We have not recognized them as appropriate for us. See, that's going to be the question. When we study these rules, do we say, aha, yes, this is really important for me. This is important for the group. I recognize the value of this rule for me here and now. So, you know, you know, there's so many people for whom these rules we're going to study are not rules at all. They're just a bunch of incomprehensible gibberish. How, how you know, they're not going to abide by these rules. And yet we are asked to do that if we recognize them as important for ourselves. It's a big stretch, okay? It is, they are ahead of us, okay? They are ahead of us, of course. But do we recognize their value? That's the question. So, with a rule, a rule needs no reinforcement. These rules are voluntarily accepted and are put to trial in the belief, there's faith involved here, in the belief that the witness of the past and the testimony of the ages warrant the effort required for the expressed requirement. See, look, there was a long time when we wondered, will there be this class? Will this class take place? Because it's an advanced class, okay? And maybe yes, maybe no, maybe we're tired, maybe we have no money, blah, 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 you know, all those things up and down, up and down. But what it boils down to is that anybody coming to this class must feel that in these rules, there may be something for them, which they can accept as a rule and try to live up to. Is that correct? Am I correct in saying that? In other words, you know, you've reviewed the raised and initiations, you've seen it, so there's something in there that speaks to you. You can accept it as a rule, perhaps, even though it's going to be difficult for all of us to live up to that kind of thing. Of course, of course. So we recognize they exist for us. They invoke our intuitive response. Nobody's going to make us do these things. We voluntarily accept that. Okay, it's a stretch, but we're going to act as if these are rules for ourselves. Now, one of the best ways of doing that, and I will, you know, repeat my old song and dance here, is to memorize the rules. Even the first seven. Memorize the first seven rules. When you're out for a walk in this beautiful Danish weather, you can repeat the rules to yourself, you see. Mutter as you go along by the beach. Nobody will know what you're thinking, but you will be reinforcing these rules in your consciousness until they become a part of you. And then it will be much easier to really learn what they're all about. Okay. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I will repeat that fairly often because I think the old method of memorization. I, I admit that it harkens back to the third ray, but if you look at the Dalai Lama and his group, it's astonishing, isn't it? There they all are, hour after hour, chanting this stuff, and they rarely look at a book. It's just completely incorporated in their nature. And then they can really say they know it, you know, much more. All right, so... Um, this means other people have been through it. The ages say they are of value. Therefore, through our intuitive response and our uh, belief or faith, we accept that they have value, and we will try as a group to make the effort required to express the requirements given. Okay? We admit they are ahead of us, okay? But we still try. And in our next life, and in our next life, and so forth, we will be closer and closer as we approach the new schools to the fulfillment of these rules. You know you are warming up for your next life now. Don't you know that? <laughs> well, it becomes especially true when the requirement of the new schools is you have to be under 42 years of age, right? You have to be between 21 and 42, and maybe only one person here. I don't know, Birgit, did you fit in that category? Um, <laughs> all the rest of us are over the hill as far as the new schools uh, are concerned. 
<laughs> okay, so this is true of the 14 rules uh, we are now going to study. I would remind you that only the initiate consciousness will truly comprehend their significance. That is the third degree, right? So we studied cosmic fire, which is only for people who have taken the third degree. And now we study these rules, which can only be understood if we've taken the third degree. But we are aspiring people, so we still have hope that something, will, something good will happen. But also, that your effort, so to do, will develop in you from the beginning, or will develop in you the beginning of that initiate consciousness, provided you seek to make practical and voluntary application of these rules in your daily life. That's quite a promise, isn't it? By the study of these rules, we will begin to develop the initiate consciousness. In other words, we're moving towards the third degree gradually here through the study of these rules. If what? If we make practical and voluntary application of these rules in the daily life. And I would just say this. Here you are. You have a study group here. The study group meets one every one, once, once a month? Every three weeks. Okay. Already, that is a practical move to make sure that you have a rhythmic approach to these things right here on the physical plane. That is a practical move. So already you're starting to do this. Now we have to see, can we make a uh, can we make practical application of these rules? Well, look at the meditation this morning. What can you do with sentence one of a practical nature? What can you do? Within the fire of mind, focus within the head's clear light, let the group stand. What can you do? Practically. You can stand, yeah. Yeah, you can hold your point of tension. You can hold your consciousness within what for you is the fire of mind. You can become aware of that center in your etheric head where the um, clear light is to be found, the light in the head in various forms. And you can stick with that instead of, um, as we all do, descending into lower states of consciousness. Now it is. It's like a roller coaster. It's like an elevator. Consciousness is not, by most of us, sustained at a high level throughout the day. You know, we get tired, it gets very physical, we get emotional, whatever happens, we don't sustain. Practically considered, we can work at sustainment, can't we? That would be practical, wouldn't it? All right, right there, sentence one, practical application. When we're in a class like this, except if the day wears on and all this, it's, it's not too hard to sustain a certain point of tension. In this point of tension we call a class, we can do that. But when we get out there in our normal life and so forth, then it gets harder. So that's where we practice. Okay? Okay. Uh, these rules, practical and voluntary application of these rules in your daily life, they are, um, when just, you know, and just let me know, I assume the picture is there and so forth, the picture of the screen. If for any reason it should fa fail or fall off, let me know. I've got my computer here, the second one, and it's showing me, in general, that I'm on the screen, but I just want to check. <clears throat> These rules, they are susceptible of three forms of application, physical, emotional, and mental, and of a fourth application which best is designated, is best designated by the words, the response of the integrated personality to soul interpretation and understanding. Okay, soul vision is required here, and the acquiescence giving in of the group personality to the vision and to understanding. And I think um, all of these rules will have physical, emotional, and mental uh, consequences in our life. And we, as a group, because after all, you are pretty much forming a group when you have a study group like this, okay? And the larger Moria Federation and faculty and all that, it's all one group in a way. We have a group personality. Do we as a group personality respond to these rules as an integrated group personality? That's what we can ask ourselves. Okay, any questions or comments up to this point?
preliminary work here, preliminary material. How many times have we read these words? You probably just studied this, didn't you, when you got together last uh, week, was it? Yeah, you probably went through it and so forth. Okay. Another point which I would call to your attention prior to interpreting the rule is that your group endeavor must be to seek group application, group meaning, and group light. What can he mean by this? Group light. Emphatically emphasize group light. I mean, who does this apply to when we, when we talk about it? Not just to me or to you or to, you know. The group is an entity, right? So when we talk about these things, we ask ourselves a question, don't we? How does this apply to us? What is the meaning of these things in terms of our functioning? What light is coming to all of us and to the group as a whole through this effort? Now, ask yourself in your own mind, are you more um, interested in your personal um, development, spiritual development, or are you interested in what the group can become? What do you think? Mm -hmm. In other words, it takes a certain amount of living, doesn't it, before we begin to outgrow that almost obsessive interest in our own personal self, you know. But after a while, when you start to merge and blend with people who are having a similar purpose and a similar objective, you begin to think of yourself more as a unity. That's a step. That's what he's trying to bring us toward. This is, after all, these are Aquarian rules, very much so, for the Aquarian age. At the seventh time that in the fifth root race, the seventh ray and the sign Aquarius have coincided the seventh time. So now we have to make it happen. Okay. So he says, um, seek group application. Um, I guess all of us are members of various groups, aren't we? Not, of course, gives us from Norway and, you know, some of you are from other parts. And uh, maybe not everyone is a member of this particular study group. But the group is solid. The study group is solid, and new people are coming in. So can there be progress for the group other than just study? That's the question. Yes, Anne, go ahead. Well, one thing we have realized, one thing we've realized is that when we get together, when we get together and study in a group, we get a better understanding, get a better understanding of, the text, of the text than when we read the text ourselves. Yes. That's the shared experience. Yes, I think I think that that is a realization that comes to the group worker. That somehow everybody's carrying a certain angle of interpretation and coming together, we shed light on each other's understanding. So, so in a way, group progress is very fast progress. Sometimes we say, hey, we're going to be, we the individual will be slowed down by the group. Sometimes some people might think that. The, the, the opposite is really true, that the group tends to uh, facilitate the progress of everybody. There may be those tough moments, you know, when you have to stop and work things out and all that, but in general, <clears throat> what DK said is that Unless there is group initiation now, the time and space schedule of the planetary logos will be slowed down. It, we, we can't make the schedule unless we start functioning together uh, as group units for initiation, for illumination, and so forth. So this is the faster way now in order to keep pace with the schedule of our planetary logos. And that's interesting, isn't it? So when you have an opportunity like this to be swept into a group which is coming under the influence of the master's thought, 
it's a very big opportunity. People might say, oh, it's just a study group. We get together, we read a book, we study. There's something much more happening. We're being swept towards the center of the ashram. And even if we can't be riding for three months on a bicycle across the United States, <laughs> there are secondary compensations. <laughs> yes, oh, it's a, I, I, it's, it's a tough one, I admit, I admit. Um, okay, so uh, we are dealing, therefore, with something basically new in the field of occult teaching. Well, it was new at the time it was written in the 1940s, and here we are, 70 years later, it's still new. This stuff has hardly been tried. A few people here or there get together in a little group, you know, try to understand, try to work things out, etc., etc. This is just the beginning of a whole new movement in group process. Okay, uh, something basically new, and the difficulty of intelligent comprehension is subsequently, consequently, great. The true, and this applies to all his work, but he really says it here, the true significances are not the simple ones which appear on the surface. And thus we are justified year after year in studying this book, because we may think, oh, we got it, you know. But that's not the depth of it, right? Not the depth. Uh, the words of these rules would seem to be almost tritely familiar. Oh, yes, everybody knows that, right? Oh, yes, all one, everybody knows that. <laughs> okay, if they meant exactly what they appear to mean, there would be no need for me to be giving hints as to their underlying significances and ideas. But they are not so simple. Well, even <laughs> I don't even think they're so simple in the way they are stated, you know. Within the fire of mind, uh, focused within the head's clear light, let the group stand. There's a certain symbolism which you have to interpret, right? If you're not a student of esotericism, what does that mean? The burning ground has done its work. Well, what does that mean? The clear cold light shines forth, and cold it is. And yet the heat evoked by the group love permits the warmth of energetic moving out. Behind the group there stands the door, before them opens out the way. Together let the band of brothers onward move, out of the fire, into the cold, and towards a new attention. Well, he can say tritely familiar, maybe tritely familiar to a student of theosophy. But if you give this to the man on the street, what are they going to make out of this? Have you studied that stuff? Okay. <laughs> right. Well, people are at all different stages of development, and some people would like to get to the bottom of things rather than just deal with the cultural trance. You know, what is the cultural trance? Did you, any of you see that movie, The Matrix? Matrix 1, Matrix 2, Matrix 3, whatever it was. You ever see that movie? It was, it's dealing about how... People are all hypnotized by what goes on in the ordinary world so that they can't break out of this trance which makes them think that their normal patterns are reality. And yet we are like, we're all hypnotized and we don't really see that we're dealing in illusion all the time which we think is real. So some people want to break out of the trance, you know. They want to wake up in short. Okay, to sum up, therefore, these rules are to be read with the aid of the developing esoteric sense. What do you make of the esoteric sense? What does the esoteric sense mean to you, the developing esoteric sense? Esoteric sense. Why sense? Why the word sense? What do you think? Yeah. Anybody? Esoteric sense? Intuition is a sense. Okay. Intuition is a sense. I, I believe there is justification uh, in general for calling the esoteric sense a kind of intuition. There are the five senses, right? There's the common sense, which is what? As he gives it a special definition in these books. Common sense. The, well, you know, the common sense comes right before the esoteric sense. So the common sense is found on the level of mind. 
It is the mind as the synthesizer of all the senses, the correlator and synthesizer, interpreter of the senses. That's the common sense. Uh, sometimes we use the word sixth sense. When we, when we use the word sixth sense, we mean intuition, but not in occultism. The sixth sense in occultism is the common sense, whereby you take all the input from the various uh, sensory modalities that we, uh, we have, and you find a way to correlate them so they make sense of the world. Um, that is that is a task to correlate the five senses, and children don't have that yet. We learn that as we go along. Yes. You may look up the the table on the evolutionary development of the senses from cosmic fire. There you will see how yes. the physical senses develops through the planes. Exactly. Every one of the five senses has a higher correspondence. We remember on every plane. So. Hasten to your cosmic fire books right around page 188 and read about all these senses that we can uh, develop. But the sixth sense is very interesting. He says um, it is basically the concrete mind and that the members of the materialistic group develop it to an extent that is unfathomable to us. They don't go higher. They extend it way, way out. They are masters of the concrete mind as a separate sphere. But now the seventh sense in occultism, that is the intuition. And that takes us to the Buddhic plane. And, you know, we've discussed how we define intuition. But basically, we call it direct knowledge. Uh, unmediated knowing. Just knowing directly. This is how we oftentimes, in a colloquial way, define uh, the intuition. Okay, and, and feeling gives oftentimes an open door to that. So, these rules should be read with the aid of the developing esoteric sense. We're not there yet, are we? What does it take to be a true intuitive? Exactly, exactly. To be a true intuitive, the beginning of that, really, is the fourth degree when you drop the lower bodies and your consciousness is permanently polarized on the intuitional plane. So then we would really be a member of the hierarchy. We would be an arhat moving towards the full illumination. So that's why he uses the word developing because we're not there yet. Okay, these rules, they are related to group initiation in spite of their having individual application. So when we read these things, it's the group interpretation which is most important, but they will say something to us individually, too. Okay. They are not what they appear to be on the surface, trite truisms and spiritual platitudes, but they are rules for initiation. I feel that we should change the font. There. Which, if followed, will take the disciple and the group through a major spiritual experience. So this is not just for study, is it? This is for application to enhance the type of spiritual experience we might have. Okay. They embody the techniques of the new age which necessitate group activity, group procedure, and united action. Do you think, uh, do any of you find yourself to be in a group where those um, qualities apply? Group activity, group procedure, united action. Do you, um, are you enough with a group so that it develops its own culture of these things? Is it so in the study group? To a degree. It is so, to a degree. And what about you and your educational activities, uh, Gisla? Out, well, do you find that these things apply in the kind of group work that you are doing? Or is it more, you know, simply the teacher and the students? Or is there a dynamic? Well, I don't know. I have to read the rules first. <laughs> okay. You, 
He is wisely deferring comment. All right, all right. <laughs> okay. Well, it 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 may. It may. But will they exercise what is called this? The techniques of the new age? That's the question. In other words, many groups are brought together on the basis of activity. You know, we have our different clubs and associations, and they do this and that. How many groups are brought together, more so, more increasingly, I think, but on the basis of consciousness? We've had, for the last hundred years, haven't we? Consciousness-raising groups, haven't we? We get together to alter our consciousness in some way. I think you can say that about your group, yes, <laughs> that it is a group in which consciousness is the main uh, objective. Yeah, elevation of. Okay. Earlier I said that these rules are the result of tried experience, and my use of the word new in this connotation is related to human knowledge, but not to initiatory procedure. What does that mean? Are these, are these rules new, or are they not new? They're, they're, they're not new, but they're new to some, aren't they? For whomever who has passed through the initiatory process, they are not new. And maybe for thousands of years or you know, millions of years, someone has known and practiced these. But to people like ourselves, they are new. New procedures for us. Okay, so what, one of the things we have to do is, you know, we're all members of groups. We, we can't help but be, even the family is a group, okay? So what is the discrimination between the groups of which we are normally a member and the kind of groups that he's talking about here? That we have to uh, try to be clear about. See, in other words, he's talking about soul groups, isn't he? Now, mostly when a group forms, people get together. You know what I mean? People get together with all their mind, emotions, body, and all the rest of it. It's a collection of people. What's a group that's a collection of souls? What is that? How is that different? I'm thinking about the people back, let's say, before 1945, when the World War was coming to an end, and they were getting together in California to found the United Nations. They already had begun to think about the post-war period and the formation of the United Nations. Was that just people getting together, or was it soul-inspired people, and so forth? See, Eleanor Roosevelt was a member of that. Some of the luminaries of the United Nations were found there. They were acting from a higher basis, right? So when you have a study group of DK, obviously the soul is the main thing, isn't it? You're not just getting together to have coffee and cookies, right? I mean, you know. Well, it, well on the other hand. <laughs> all right. Well, some of us do. Yes. <laughs> yes, I know. It's Denmark and coffee and cookies are important. I know that. <laughs> okay. They're speaking of a break, right? You see, all they have to do is start talking about coffee and cookies and the mind. What just happened to the point of tension? What did you do at the point of tension? <laughs> yes. Teams. You have teams. Teams, you Teams working together. Teams working together. But in the group, it's like every person. A specific, That's a specific responsibility, responsibility. A, special, a specific role. Uh, a specific role. The whole idea of teamwork, I think, is coming in very strongly now. I think it's the response of ordinary society to the Aquarian energies which are coming in. And you've been involved in large corporation team building and all of that, haven't you? Yeah. You know, uh, we're told that if groups like ourselves on the second ray don't do the job, uh, it will be another way will be found. And I think the way the Ageless Wisdom has been entering the business community is one of those ways. You know, sort of Master R's department, if you will. The whole, yes, go ahead. Even now it's more study group. Over time, it's like different person has a specific quality and knowledge. One will know about the other, another about it. Keeping time, you know, it's Yeah, everybody has their own 
qualities, roles that they contribute. Exactly. What do we call this? Um, division of labor. We call it also unity in diversity and diversity in unity. So in other words, we're all known, and this is what, how DK wants us to think. He wants us to think according to our energy qualities. And that's why he has to study our rays and astrology and our particular uh, stage of development. So we become energy units, energy force units that in a you know abstracted way we contribute to the group rather than taking everything personally. See? We study each other as energy units. This is something new uh, from occultism, something which has only come in the past century, really. This kind of way of viewing the human being as an energy unit, this is new with uh, theosophy, I would say, with HPB and what followed from her. So it's a much more Aquarian way of looking at things, isn't it? Maybe the Aquarian age, in a certain sense, began with uh, Francis Bacon emerging. Sun in Aquarius, Aquarius rising, Mercury in Aquarius, great seventh ray initiate, uh, starting the whole thing going. A 500-year lead-up to that. Maybe uh, 250 years later or so, uh, the, the founding of the Theosophical Society was a very strong Aquarian movement, meant to be. What was it, Jupiter and Uranus were in Aquarius in one of those charts? Either the TS chart or Blavatsky's chart? Maybe Blavatsky's chart, yeah. And now we, we go another 250 years. We come up to the year 2125 or 2117, the actual beginning. So we, we're almost through the 500-year lead-up period uh, to the real beginning of the age of Aquarius. So that, that's the context in which we are studying these things. Okay. Okay, tried experience. Um, so it's not new to initiatory procedure. That has always existed and always, at the great crisis, crises of initiation, disciples have moved forward in groups, even though they have not been aware of doing so. Isn't that interesting? Even, you know, um, I'm remembering, you know, uh, well, he'll, te he'll tell us more about this, but uh, in the Masonic Lodge, uh, you can take initiation by yourself. But sometimes their schedule is so crowded you have to go through in groups of threes or groups of fives. And then you have to divide up your initiatory procedure. But apparently that is a reflection of how things really are. So the difference in the old days was there was group initiation, but the people didn't know it. And now what? See, now they will know who they may be passing through with, with whom they may be passing through. See, people like ourselves that are training together, we may pass through together, each individually at their own stage, but the group as a whole receiving some sort of empowerment as a group. Does this subject interest you, group initiation? I mean, you know, the answer better be yes. But okay, look, but see, why would it interest you? Why would group initiation interest you at this time? Well, it is it is the way of the times, as you say, the only way. But is what is the basis of the appeal to you of the idea of group initiation? More energy, yes, yes. So increase of energy, more so for the group as a whole, which really means, you know, in a way, uh, the Christ looks at us and he basically says, poor ones for all of us poor ones. In other words, you have so little. So he says, I've come uh, that you may have li life more abundantly. He says that. So when you say more energy, well, it's like the wealth of the, of the universe begins to pour in, and we are elevated in our acquisition of the real life of the universe. Right now, we are relatively poor. You may think of a, you know, I'm looking at this guy, you know, he's a very bright guy, obviously, third ray. Uh, Zuckerberg is his name, and he's doing all this stuff with Facebook, and he, I don't know how many billions of dollars he has, but, you know, to have the symbols of wealth in human terms, is it to be wealthy? By the way, he is a Taurus, I found out. <laughs> um, 
uh, third-rate Taurus, I guess that's uh, that, that's like uh, China or something. Um, uh, is that real wealth? I mean, what is wealth? See, what is wealth? What is abundance, really? When you get rid of the cost of body. <laughs> well, in a way, in a way, because you know, then you're a rich young man. You're ri when you get well in the causal body, you're still a rich young man. When you get rid of it, then you're beyond being a rich young man. You're, you, you have a, a, a you're a real man. <laughs> yes. I think it's freedom. Freedom, freedom is wealth. Okay, in a way, okay, I'll say something that ties in with what you said. Uh, the 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 Buddha basically said that the one who has the fewest desires is the most wealthy. See what I mean? In other words, somehow every desire is a state of uh, wanting. It's a state of lack. It emphasizes the opposite of the abundance. And so when we get rid of at least of our desires for the lower world, we become rich with respect to the lower world. I'm remembering this um, book um, called Siddhartha. Did you ever read Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse? Good fourth-ray German type. Uh, it's a story about the Buddha, basically, or Prince Siddhartha. And at one point, um, he said, well, I don't have much, but I can think, I can wait, and I can fast. And I began to think about that. I can think, I can wait, and I can fast. He had the power of thought, he had patience, and he didn't need to be sustained in the normal way by the physical world. He had nothing. Was he rich or poor? See, already he was on his way to spiritual wealth, wasn't he? It's just a question of the adjustment of the sense of values, isn't it? Because we, we must adjust our sense of values so we pursue what is spiritual values compared to, you know, what we normally pursue. You were going to say, Ella, yes. In the very tale, in the very tale, in the very tale, to teach me the most wealthy man in the world, and uh, the answer I don't remember as well as I do, but the answer is that he didn't know the shirt. He didn't. The wealthiest man. The wealthiest. He, he didn't own the shirt. He didn't own the shirt. Okay, I, what was the last word? Shirt. 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 He didn't. Oh, the wealthiest man didn't even own a shirt. He owned the, the shirt of the wealthiest man. Uh huh. How, how, how interesting, how interesting. Well, it, go, it goes with the old saying that, you know, I give you the shirt off my back idea. In other words, the one who gives away the most is the wealthiest. And it ties in with this old occult saying, to those who give all, all is given. That's amazing thought, isn't it? You know, and that's the whole Aquarian ideal, isn't it? You pour forth everything you have, and even more uh, comes in so you can give again. This is a whole new set of spiritual values compared to, you know, cornering the market. In a way, we have a square between Scorpio and Aquarius. D.K. talks about Scorpio, uh, the negative influence of it, as cornering the market, grabbing for yourself into kind of a black hole, everything you can lay your hands on. And Aquarius is at the square, and it means to give out for the distribution for everyone what is of value. It is a big uh, battle going on right now in our financial community. Yes. I think the problem is, or has been, that we don't create energy. When you give out, you create energy. And when you get energy back. They stop it up. They don't really create energy. No, that's true. Well, I think... By giving out, you create energy. It comes back. You know, I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about vampires, <laughs> and I'm thinking about the you know vampires are popular these days. You know, there's a lot of money in vampires. But it's still a Chinese strong third ray nation, and they are doing a lot of work in yeah. Africa these days. And there are many sides. To the many story, sides to the story. But still, many sides they are story. Great, China is uh, creating. New situation in Africa. Uh, yes, and, and they're a Taurian, you know, they're a Taurian country in their soul. It's not, it's not the same as Scorpio, you know. Uh, yeah, they have Libra uh, external uh, personality. China does. They expect to get something back. They expect yes, to get something. But they also create a new situation. 
a new situation in Africa. See, here's the thing about expectation of return. Do we do something for the purpose of expectation of return? And many of us still do. Even, you know, the old saying, I'll love you if you love me, you know, kind of thing. There's got to be a return flow. But the great ones know the laws. So they don't worry about the return flow. They know it's just law, you know. So some of the most spiritual human beings in the world have been among the wealthiest simply because that's how the law works. <laughs> you know, Master R, as the Comte de Saint-Germain, he was a pretty rich guy, you know. That's how he attracted the attention of the court. He said, a man of fabulous wealth has just arrived in the country, so let's get to know him, you know. Yes. Yeah, the Aquarian way, way is different from the Chinese way. It's different from the Chinese way. You, you, know, you never get it back from the same, same source. Same. You give it to them. Yes, and that's a bit like karma too, you know. In other words, it doesn't work tit for tat or one to one. Let's just, let's just suppose, you know, you've been bad and you've killed a lot of people. It, it's not that you have to die that many times. You, you may, in fact, uh, be in a situation where you're giving life to many, many different people. It's all the whole, isn't it? You may come back as a physician and be responsible for saving many lives. The equations of karma are very interesting. They don't necessarily work in a linear manner, you know. So anyway, uh, yes. Difference. Big difference between, a big difference between, difference between, between the U.S. and East of Denmark. From the U.S. and Denmark. And Scandinavian countries. And Scandinavian countries. Where in the U.S. Uh, many people, people give money away. Give money away. For different Here, purposes. we pay by the tax. So Here, we, we pay by the tax. Was, you know, so, so. Money is taken from us and given to various things, hospitals, roads, whatever. So money is taken uh, from the and taxes and given to me. I mean, yeah, the individual yeah. gives money to different purposes. Yes, the individual has perhaps more say. It's less socialized, isn't it? Right. Yes. Well, it, it gets there, doesn't it? It just depends on whether the people in the Scandinavian countries sort of acquiesce to this yeah, system. Yeah, and you have to give because you want to give. Yes. Here we give because we have to give. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here we give because we have to give, and there in the U.S., we give because we want to give. Well, and there may be ulterior motives as well. Look, the individual in the U.S. is very strongly emphasized. However, it is an Aquarian country, which means that some form of enlightened socialism will eventually have to occur. The, the most socialistic sign is somehow Aquarius. It's the, it's the sign of the hierarchy. It, one for all and all for one. I mean, people cooperate. You know, so when in the communist countries, what did they say? They had a very fine motto, uh, from each, uh, to each according to his need, from each according to his abilities. That's marvelous, if, if anyone could live up to it, you know. And that is actually the way it works in hierarchy, you know, that, that is. An enlightened form of communism or socialism, enlightened, uh, is probably the destiny of the human race if it's not going to blow itself up. I know, you know, pretty soon we have to take that, that break. Um, what, what time is it right now? Oh, okay, it's 25 minutes to 11. Okay, well, almost any minute now there will be a break. Okay, so just hang in there. <laughs> yes, I can't say to this precise man almost any minute now, can I? So disciples move forward in groups, even though they have not been aware of so doing. But he says, now it's a different time, and you may find on the, on the physical plane the same group with which you are affiliated inwardly. And if and when you do, that represents a great opportunity to get those two things in alignment. See, sometimes we may be affiliated with people who never meet them on the physical plane. We never form with them on the physical plane. But now with the Internet, people with common interests who would never meet each other are finding each other and can actually work together. This represents a tremendous acceleration, uh, potentially. Now disciples can become so aware, and the various ray ashrams, um, will not only present their groups, large or small, to the initiator, but the personnel of these groups will now be aware of the fact of group presentation. So this is a change. We will know 
that we are being presented in groups to the initiator. This means that the Christ may be initiating groups of people, and Sanat Kumara the same, although it tends to be the case that the groups get smaller as the initiations rise. Okay, they will also have to grasp the fact of the extent of their knowledge being dependent on decentralization. Wow, that's a statement. The extent of their knowledge being dependent on decentralization, I would ask you to ponder and reflect upon this last statement. What does that mean to us? Group presentation and our knowledge in respect to initiation and preparation will be large or small depending on our degree of decentralization. What does it mean and why? What do you think? Do you feel like a decentralized individual? Are you off the center of your own stage? When you look out at the world do you see yourself as the primary figure in the foreground, or are you shrinking? And is the whole picture becoming uh, the main thing, with you just being a little dot in that picture? <laughs> see what I mean? That, that's about decentralization, isn't it? Just think. That's if why That's why we're here. Exactly. Suppose when we look out at the world, there we are all the time in the mirror. You know, it's like you can't see anything else. So how are you ever going to expand your knowledge of the world when you're always looking at your little self? You may expand your knowledge of your little self <laughs> quite a bit, as is sometimes done with the Leo energy, they say. You know, uh, self-sensitivity and all that. But the more decentralized we are, the more we understand the whole. Uh, Ramakrishna is said to have said of his own identity, it's a very shrewd thing he said, uh, I am less than the dust on your feet. What did he mean by that? <laughs> See, was this, was this a statement of profound humility, or was he somehow identifying as the one and only being that could not even be contained in a particle? In other words, it was everywhere, you see. It's smaller than the smallest thing and greater than the greatest, as the Upanishads would have it. So, you know, uh, what's interesting about Ramakrishna, I, I, I went through a phase where I read a lot about those people in the South Indian school. And uh, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, so Vivekananda was known as the great sage, and Ramakrishna was known as the great mystic. He was very mystical, you know, it seemed like he was... The pictures of him are, some of them, in a state of samadhi. Ramakrishna in a state of samadhi, you know. People are holding him up because he's so blissed out, you know. But the interesting thing was, with Vivekananda, I told you this story, you know, he just memorized encyclopedias. He had this incredible encyclopedic mind. He would chain himself to his desk at night, so he was forced to study. See, he was he, applying the will. But he said, oh no, I'm not the nanny. Ramakrishna is the true nani yoga. I'm the bhakti by comparison. See, so really, when he looked at Ramakrishna, he saw the true knowledge yoga, the nani yoga, G-N-A-N-I. This was his estimation. They had kind of a, a mutual admiration society. Um, what Ramakrishna is said to have said of Vivekananda, when Vivekananda discovers who he really is, he will not stay long. And he died at the age of 39, or, you know, voluntarily or otherwise. But just imagine a life in which you accomplish so much, <laughs> you know, in that small amount of time. I, I'm amused by a story about the 1893 a Great Congress of Religions in Chicago at the Columbian Exposition of 1893. And, uh, you know, all the learned theosophists, uh, we're addressing the group, you know, and all these people in a scholarly way. <laughs> it's, a, it's very moving. And um, uh, so it, it came to be Vivekananda's turn. And he got up, and uh, he had been spending the night in his saffron robe out in the park. You know, he didn't have any place to stay. And uh, he, he simply said this. He said, brothers and sisters of the West, 
Everyone leapt to their feet and started cheering and applauding. You know, they're going to sleep when the theosophists are talking. And all he has to say is brothers and sisters of the West. You know, it was such a wave of energy that everybody immediately responded. So, you know, it's not what we say. It's the energy that we carry. He had a huge energy. And uh, he you know, was responsible for basically taking uh, Ramakrishna's thought and establishing uh, it in the West, in the uh, Vedantin societies, you know, that still exists in this time. So anyway, uh, knowledge and decentralization. The less we are in our own eyes, and the more we see things in proportion, the more we understand ourselves as a tiny monadic cell in a chakra of the planetary logos, the greater will be our knowledge. Now, most people, you know, the world revolves around them. You know what I mean? The personality, they got their eyes on the personal self. It's me, me, me. How can you see anything when that is the state? So have you noticed, if you've studied occultism, how your perspective about the world has changed? Your perspective of who you are, where you fit, how big or small, what's big, what's small, and all that. And a lot of people refuse to study occultism for exactly that reason. You know what I mean? Because it will have such a disastrous effect on their glorified self-image. As DK refers to us, microscopic man. Microscopic man. And uh, you know the old thing in the Bible, uh, what is man that thou shouldst be mindful of him? You know, it's, it's spoken from perspective. Okay, are there any thoughts or questions before you are... Um, released to the outer chamber <laughs> where cookies and coffee await or whatever, you know. Any anything you'd like to say about what we've studied so far in this lead up to the rule itself? Anything? Okay. All right, good. Um oh I've got a loud microphone level here. All right. Uh I'll tell you what then um we'll take a little fifteen minute break. And we'll come back and we'll begin actually with rule one per se. Okay? All right. We'll see you soon. Okay. Stop. Okay, and everybody that's on electronically, um, we'll take a little break back in 15 minutes. It's 1045 now. We'll be back at 11, which is 9. Uh, AM GMT, and I hate to think what time it is in Australia and New Zealand. Okay, we do have some um, Australians and New Zealanders with us. Glad you're all here. Uh, 17 in the attendee list. Oh, Roger, you're here too. Tracy, nice to see you. Nicholas, Lynn, Leslie, nice to see you. Leia from Australia. Johanna, you're here. Joe, Hogney, Kelly, hi. Uh, Gary, Elena, Daniel, Celeste, Carol. Um, Anne is here. She's right here in the room. She's just making sure we don't fall off the line. And Andrew in Melbourne, good to see you all. All right, we'll take a little, little break. Come up for air.